Interim Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and, and Innovation, Interim Dean of Graduate Research, UW colleagues, finalists, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2022 virtual UW three minute thesis final. My name is Hongling Chen. I am Deputy Dean of Graduate Research. It's my great pleasure to be your MC today. And co hosting the event with me is Jack Egan, a journalist from UW TV. Welcome, Jack. Thank you, Honglin. It's a pleasure to be a part of this wonderful event. We would like to begin with an acknowledgement of country video produced by Wulianga Indigenous Center here at UW. country for Aboriginal peoples is an interconnected set of ancient and sophisticated relationships. The University of Wollongong spreads across many interrelated Aboriginal countries that are bound by their sacred landscape, an intimate relationship with that landscape since creation. From Sydney to the Southern Highlands to the South Coast, from freshwater to Biddlewater, to Salt. From city, to urban, to rural. The University of Wollongong acknowledges the custodianship of the Aboriginal peoples of this place and space that has kept alive the relationships between all living things. The University acknowledges the devastating impact of colonisation on our campus's footprint commit ourselves to truth-telling, healing and education. Thank you. What a powerful way to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of land on which we meet and share our ideas today. It takes at least three years to complete PhD thesis that are up to 80,000 80, words long. Today, none of our brightest research students will have just three minutes and one slide to explain their research in concise, convincing and engaging language. Originating in the University of Queensland in, 20, in, in 2008, 3MT provides a great opportunity for HDR candidates to practice and learn how to effectively communicate their research to a broad audience. The winner of the final today will go on to represent UOW to complete in the 2022 Asia Pacific competition with the final to be held virtually on 19th October, 2022. Now it is with, with my great pleasure that I introduce Professor Patricia Davison, the Vice Chancellor to say a few words. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Chen, and welcome everybody. It's great to see so many colleagues, our HDR candidates, distinguished guests, and most importantly, our 2022 um, three-minute thesis 
finalists. Um, congratulating congratulations for getting to the final I've loved seeing on social media and other um, sites uh, the great work that's happened to date uh, as Professor Chen mentioned um, the three-minute thesis is such a highlight of our research agenda here at the University of Wollongong and it's such a great way to bring the whole of our community together um, this is one of my favourite events, and in fact, um, as uh, Professor Chen mentioned, the Three Minute Thesis is an Australian innovation, and I had the great pleasure of being able to bring this to Johns Hopkins when I was there, and everyone had just as much fun as we have here in Australia. I know this afternoon is going to be really inspirational. We have fabulous and exciting presentations. I think it's important that we think about these presentations as set in uh, really an ecosystem, ecosystem, not so echo exorcising, sorry, ecosystem. I'm still a bit jet lagged. That's my excuse for my um, neural synapses. Um, but, you know, I think it's great to see our HDR students who are really beginning on a career that is going to expand and develop to expand on society's knowledge and to address some of our really challenging problems in our society. Um, I, our HDR students graduate to go forward to inspire, create and innovate. And also at this point, I want to um, acknowledge the amazing academic supervisors who are here at the University of Wollongong and their collaborators and the fabulous staff that support our research enterprise. I think it's really important to, as part of the research journey, and perhaps my address is not um, a great example today, but I think one of the great um, graduate attributes emerging from a PhD program is the ability to present clear, concise, and compelling information. And, as we work to solve the co compelling problems that um, are in our society today, we need confident and articulate researchers like you here today, our finalists, so that expert knowledge can be easily communicated and um, taken up broadly by industry and policymakers. I really commend all contents contestants who have worked so hard to prepare their presentations here today. Um, it's no mean feat and the less is more advice is often much harder to achieve than um, long and verbose. So um, congratulations to everyone and also the people that contributed within the other rounds within the faculties and schools. The three minute thesis is an important art in mastering precision and persuasion. And I really um, commend everybody here today. Also, it's a courageous act to put yourself out there for this scrutiny by your peers and your colleagues, but I'm really excited to hear the presentations here today. So good luck everyone. Um, and I look forward to the presentations. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor, for that warm welcome and those inspiring words. The art of precision and persuasion, those will be the qualities that the judges will, look, will, will be looking for in today's um, presentations. The UOW final is an exciting culmination of faculty heats. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our nine finalist speakers who were chosen from each of the faculties and AIM, the Australian Institute for Innovative Materials. The finalists are Carly Baker from the Australian Institute for Innovative Materials, David Haviat from the Faculty of Business and Law, Sarah O'Hay Miller from the Faculty of Science, Medicine and Health, Mark Donovan from the Faculty of the Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities, Sarah Vogel from the Faculty of Engineering and Information Sciences, Natalie Day from the Faculty of the Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities, Eileen Wallace from the Australian Institute for Innovative Materials, Catherine Stephen from the Faculty of Science, Medicine and Health, 
and Michael Stapleton from the Faculty of Engineering and Information Science. We wish the very best to all the finalists. This will be an afternoon to remember. These, they are nine fascinating topics you can expect to hear about. The presentations will be judged by a panel of experts with a range of expertise and experience across different disciplines. Join us today, Professor Patricia Davison, Vice Chancellor and President, a global leader in cardiac health and health education. Professor David Caro, Interim Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation and Deputy Vice Chancellor Health and Sustainable Futures and esteemed researcher in council control and health services research. Professor Lorna Moxon, Interim Dean of Graduate Research, leader in mental health care and education and a co-founder of award-winning recovery camp for people living with mental illness. Professor Hui Jun Li, Associate Dean of High Degree Research from EIS, eminent material scientists listed in the 250 top researchers in Australia in 2021. Dr. Aaron Twyford, lecturer in counting, the current chair of Early Career Researcher Network in BAL, ECR representatives on the University Research Committee and the chair of Early Career Disruption Committee. Natalie Chapman, an award-winning STEM commercialization and marketing strategy expert, managing director and the founder of Gem Maker, a rapidly growing consultancy that provides expert advice, services, and a training to commercialize new knowledge and technologies. Welcome and thank you, Natalie, for joining us today. Finally, students as partners, we are I'm, I'm delighted to introduce our first ever student representative on the 3MT judging panel, Davina Robinson, a third year PhD candidate from the School of Psychology. Davina is a Warata Scholar, a, a recipient of prestigious Warata Scholarship funded by the New South Wales Department of Education. In a short while, you, we will play pre-recorded presentations. Comp Competitors will not be judged. Uh, will not be judged on the uh, 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 will, will not be judged on the video recording quality or editing capabilities. Our judging will focus on the presentation slide and ability to communicate complex research in an interesting, accessible, and compelling manner. There are two main criteria: comprehension and the content. The judges will be looking for the ability to pitch a carefully planned and easily understood exposition of a new idea and its significance and the benefits. Engagement and communication. The judges will also be looking for evidence to speak with passion and to connect with the audience in such a way to move and motivate and inspire them and to keep us wanting to know more. Keep this judging criteria in mind as you vote for the People's of Choice Awards. After each video presentation, one of the judges will make a comment and ask the candidate a question. We're delighted to have such an expert judging panel. They will have a difficult job ahead of them deciding this year's 3MT winner. Today's winner will receive a prize of $1,500 and the runner-up receiving $1,000. Following the presentations from the finalists, a poll will be displayed on your screen. You, our audience, will be invited to vote on who you thought gave the most convincing and engaging 3MT presentation. This person will win the People's Choice Award along with $500. The running order in which the finalist research will be showcased has been drawn randomly. Our first, <clears throat> our first contestant is Carly Baker. Carly studied a Bachelor of Science with honors in chemistry. Her thesis involved synthesis and characterization of novel molecular polymer brushes. She's currently in her third year of PhD in polymer science with an application in bioelectronics at the Intelligent Polymer Research Institute 
Carly will present the next generation of implantable devices, plastics to the rescue. Imagine having a car accident and ending up with a spinal cord injury. The fact that our spines are so delicate that a single event could define the rest of our lives. It scares the living daylight out of me, but this could be a thing of the past. I suppose you've heard of Elon Musk. Back in 2016, he founded a company called Neuralink, which aims to create devices that can be implanted in the brain to treat conditions like spinal cord injuries. Yet why haven't we heard anything of these remarkable devices? It's because our current implantable devices are made of metal. And the way that metal interacts with the body is like combining oil and water. They don't mix. This poor integration known as an interface triggers an immune response and decreases the cell electrode interaction over time, as shown in the image on the left. This is a key problem in the field of bioelectronics, which I am trying to address in my PhD. So my strategy is to use plastics to replace metal. Not just any plastic though, but a special type of plastic termed a conducting polymer. So conducting polymers are soft, they're flexible, but they're still not good enough. What we need to do is create a disguise for this plastic so that it can better interact with the body. If it's interacting with the body, it will prevent an immune response. I'm using cholesterol for this. Why cholesterol? Well, it's a very important component in the makeup of our cells and it's vital for our survival. So if I disguise a plastic with cholesterol, then it will better interact with cells as shown in the image on the right. If it's interacting with cells, it will prevent an immune response, increase the lifetimes and the application of these devices. Don't worry though, there won't be any health problems associated with excess cholesterol because it will be attached to the plastic as shown. So over the course of my PhD, I've made several plastics with promising properties for future bioelectronics. I've shown that certain materials disguised with cholesterol can be electrically active under biological conditions with good switching between the on and the off state. Future studies will investigate the biocompatibility of these materials. So in other words, if I grow cells on the materials, will the cells live or die? Next year, I will go to the University of Cambridge to further explore the biological and electronic properties of these materials with world-renowned experts in this area. By the end of my PhD, I will have a library of materials that I can pass on to collaborators for further work in this area. Perhaps I will lay the foundations for a company like Neuralink, revolutionising the field of bioelectronics and changing the lives of people with spinal cord injuries. Thank you, Carly. I'd now like to invite Professor Patricia Davidson to ask a question for Carly. Thank you. I'm, I'm already here. Um, look, thank you firstly, Carly, for that question. Um, as a naive question, um, the notion of plastics as a sort of a problem in society, is there any potential, I know you're using a very special form of plastic, but there is there any sustainability aspect of um, the material that you're thinking about using? Um, sorry, can, am I seeing on the, I don't know. Um, Hi, I can see you, Carly. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so in terms of the sustainability of my material, so the idea is that I'm using cholesterol because it's a biomolecule. So a biomolecule will, um, it will allow the polymer or the plastic to interact with the body, which provides a sustainability in terms of the implantable device. And um, since I'm using this natural um, biomolecule, it's expected that if it was, um, removed from the body, for example, and disposed of, it would break down um, quite well in um, under uh, neutral conditions, um, I guess, yeah. Thanks, Carly. Excellent answer.
Thank you. That was Carly Baker from AIM. Our next contestant is David Haviat. After successful career spanning telecommunication and energy, including senior roles in corporate sales, public affairs, and regulation and strategy, and serving as a ministerial advisor and a speechwriter, David is pursuing his study, finding answers to some of the challenging issues facing the electricity sector. David will present regulation without guesswork. Electricity prices have been in the news quite a lot lately, but you may not realize that half the cost of the re of a retail electricity comes from the network costs, that is from the poles and wires. Apart from costing a lot, we also need these networks to change the way they operate. The small local area networks need to be able to host more solar PV, and they need to adapt to make sure they don't have older voltage events. The bigger transmission networks uh, need to deal with the instability introduced by lots of wind and solar generation. Now, networks are natural monopolies, and that means we subject them to an economic regulation. A regulator determines the revenue they're allowed to earn. So my research is in the theory of economic regulation as it's used in the regulation of electricity networks. You could call it the dismal science applied to a dismal topic, but I'd prefer to think about the upside, which is the objective, lower prices, and a smoother transition to, to clean energy. Now, in most markets, competitive processes generate lower prices and innovation. So as regulators, what they, the goal of regulators is to mimic these competitive processes. We go part of that way already in Australia with a thing called incentive regulation. This means that we, the network gets to keep some of the savings as profits that it makes to make if it reduces its costs. But we also need innovation. And to get innovation, we need to increase the incentives for innovation. But the challenge is how do we reward innovation while not raising prices? Ultimately, the solution is to reward the networks less for what they own and more for what they do. In the process, we can reduce the estimation task of the regulator. They don't need to think as much about what the future cost of the network might be. There are three parts to my solution. The first is getting consumers more involved in deciding what networks will do. Uh, on this, I've just had a paper published that reports on trials we did in Australia that did just that. The second is about recognising the relationship between the allowed rate of return that regulators set and the incentives they provide. This draws on a paper co-authored with my supervisor which highlights the way regulators have been misusing finance theory. And the third is just look at the incentives themselves and identify the, the incentives that best generate better outcomes rather than just lower inputs, and that is costs. The outcome should be theory that can be applied to produce better regulation. Better regulation that reduces the price of electricity while accelerating the transition to zero emissions energy. Thank you, David. I'd like, like now to invite Professor David uh, Caro to ask a question. David, uh, thank you for that great presentation. What a timely uh, area of research. What drew you to this area of research in the first place? That's an extremely good question. Um, Basically, the short answer is a lifetime spent in uh, regulated sectors, uh, firstly telecommunications and then electricity. Uh, the last five years I spent working for um, an organisation called Energy Consumers Australia, where I got, if you like, up close and personal with the failings of our regulatory scheme. Um, it's, it's uh, I think the only way to describe it is a... Um, uh, a mess, um, to put it bluntly. Um, it, it's quite remarkable how little uh, attention is paid to economic theory in the way regulators go about doing things. There's actually quite solid theory that's not applied well. And my, my, my premise is it's not applied well 
because it's not demonstrating how the benefits can, what the real benefits are from using theory. And that's the point of, of the work focusing on the reducing, reducing prices to consumers and uh, facilitating the transition to zero energy, zero, sorry, zero emissions. Great. Thank you so much, David. My pleasure. That was David from BAL. Next up is Sarah O'Hay Miller. Sarah completed an undergraduate degree in marine science in 2018 and spent her honours year investigating the behavioural interactions between invasive and native freshwater crayfish. Sarah focuses on the critically endangered Fitzroy Falls spiny crayfish. She will present Keeping Up with the Crayfish. Imagine one day an unwelcome visitor moves into your home. They start eating all your food, they even sleep in your bed, and you try your best to reclaim the stuff that was once yours. But this visitor is really aggressive, and so eventually you're forced to leave. This is the effect many invasive species have on native populations. In Australian freshwater ecosystems, invasive species have become especially problematic in this way. Allow me to introduce you to one such invasive species, the common yabby or Carax destructor. Now, this is an Australian native freshwater crayfish. However, they have spread widely beyond their natural range in Australia. And because of their aggressive nature, they now represent a significant threat to many other native Australian crayfish. One of those crayfish is the critically endangered Euasticus starawallis. Now, let me tell you, Euasticus starawallis doesn't have it easy. This species has a range restricted to only nine kilometres of Wilds Meadow Creek in the Southern Highlands region of New South Wales, Australia, and their entire range is crawling with invasive Carex destructor. But what extent of impact does Carex destructor have on Uaskis Dara Wallace? To answer this question, I conducted an extensive 12 month removal of the Carex destructor population from a section of Wilds Meadow Creek and actively radio tracked Uaska Star Wallace before and after their removal to determine if their absence impacted the activity patterns of Uaska Star Wallace. What I found was a significant 42% reduction in activity of Uaska Star Wallace after the removal of Carex destructor. This drastic reduction in activity may be an indication that in the absence of the invasive species, Uaska Star Wallace doesn't have to move around more looking for resources that they were previously competing Carex destructor for. This result is concerning because in the presence of Carex destructor, Uaska Star Wallace may be directing significant energy towards competing for resources instead of towards other areas such as reproduction. This research is providing important evidence surrounding the impacts of Carex destructor and will have management implications to secure the future of not just Uaska Star Wallace for many other native Australian crayfish too. Thank you, Sarah. I'd now like to invite Professor Lorna Moxham to ask a question for Sarah. Thanks, Sarah, such an, an important topic and you're clearly passionate. Can you tell us how you came to be so passionate about this particular topic? Thanks for your question, Lorna. So I obviously, in my introduction, I did an undergraduate degree in marine science, and then I moved into an honours um, honors year where I investigated behavioural interactions between invasive and native crayfish. And during that year, I came to understand the extent to which invasive crayfish are a problem especially in our Australian freshwater ecosystems, how far Carex destructor as a species has proliferated. It's now found in all Australian states and territories 
as an invasive species. So it really does represent this huge problem um, for Australian biodiversity in general. So that's how I've gotten into the research topic. And it's, it's such an important question. I'm really glad I've ended up here. Thanks, Sarah. That was Sarah O'Hay Miller from SMAR. Our next contestant is Mark Donovan. Mark has worked as a child and a family psychologist for 30 years. His PhD is an examination of a parenting program he has developed over the past 15 years, Confident Carers, Cooperative Kids. Mark will present Mind and the Family, helping our vulnerable children and the parents. Parenting programs are one of the most effective services offered by psychologists and yet fail half the parents who attend. These programs address a real need. One in eight children show significant behaviour problems, often persisting into adulthood and causing family breakdown, which ripples out. Economists estimate that a child with behaviour problems costs society 10 times more than the average child. I've worked as a child and family psychologist for 30 years. In that time, I've noticed that while the number of parenting programs grew each year, the recipe stayed the same, only helping half the families. It's not that the strategies are wrong. The advice is spot on. Praise your child's positive behaviours, ignore the negative. Set clear limits, be consistent. The problem is that in the trenches of day-to-day -day family life, most parents struggle to remember and then use these effective behavioural strategies. 15 years ago, I co-developed the Confident Carers Cooperative Kids Program as a new approach to parenting intervention. We wanted to offer an integrated program that taught parents the most effective strategies and equipped them with the ability to use these strategies in moments of high stress. We took the latest research in neuroscience to develop a program that added right hemisphere mindfulness, imagery and metaphors to the left hemisphere language based behavioural strategies. My PhD sought to rigorously test what we'd heard anecdotally, that this new approach really worked. It made parents more confident, kids more cooperative and helped families to reconnect. My question was simple. Does our program work for the 50% failed by existing programs? Does it help high risk families? Does it help fathers? First, we ran a quasi-experimental pilot study with 34 parents. We found significant and large effects across all measures. Child behaviour, parenting approach, parent well-being. And our largest effects were for our high-risk families. We wanted to know if these exciting results would hold with the larger set of parents. We examined our 10-year archival data set involving over 300 parents using the same core questions, and found the same answers. Importantly, attendance and outcomes were high across all socio-demographic groups, including fathers. So what do these promising early results tell us? That this new approach does work, including for those traditionally failed. However, the implications are much broader than a tick of approval for just one program. If our results hold, then we need to rethink how we fund and run parenting programs. In short, we need to integrate left hemisphere strategies with right hemisphere storytelling if we're to truly help our most vulnerable children and families. Thank you, Mark. I'd now like to invite Professor Hui Jing Li to ask a question for Mark. Thank you very much, Mark. I think this is a really interesting topic to me. A, well, I'm asking a question from a scientist point of view. A, what a sort of sample size do you need to draw a convincing conclusion? Because you uh, said you probably uh, uh, get some information from about 300 parents. So, from that sample size, can you draw a convincing conclusion or you need more uh, uh, samples? Uh, thank you for the question, Professor Lee. So um, it's a start, I'd say. Uh, you know, it's a 10-year sample, so it's great and it's real world. 
you know, the, these aren't people who've just selected to, to come along and join some research. They've come to get some help. So we know that these are the parents who, who we're looking, you know, in the future to help. Um, but of course, you know, these are just pre-post uh, measures that we've used. We haven't got an RCT yet. Um, and we'd like to um, also, you know, test the program beyond um, UOW, which we did do for that first study. That was at a, a, a local NGO, Care South, who, um, who, whose parents took part. Um, but we'd like to, you know, have a chance to test this in, in you know, in other, in other services to see if we can get the same sorts of effects um, with, you know, without me supervising the people who are who are doing the study you know so um but th as i said the, the results are promising um we, we've got lots of good feedback the the phd that i'm undertaking currently and we've got three papers up so far um is the first step in many and going back to your first question numbers yeah we'll need uh we'll need you know an rct could be less than 300 certainly to to you know to, to make some further um you know, between group type of conclusions. Um, but uh, we're happy with the promising start that we've done so far. Thank you very much. Great answer. Thank you. That was Mark, our fourth contestant from ASH. Up next is Sarah Bogle. Sarah is a postgraduate research ward scholar with the Australian Institute of Nuclear Science and Engineering. Sarah is also sponsored under the scholarship Ains, ANSTO and French Embassies program, where she will travel to and conduct research at a partner university in France later this year. Sarah will present treating brain cancer with one shot. Cancer, it's a word we all fear, but with today's medical advances, some cancers are significantly easier to treat or are even curable. However, one of the most complex kinds that we still struggle to treat is brain cancer. Our brains are our most sensitive organ encased in a protective shell. Surgery to remove a tumor there can sometimes be all but impossible. And the protective blood brain barrier makes use of chemotherapy exceptionally difficult. Our only viable option then is external beam radiation therapy but even that has its shortcomings. To properly treat a brain cancer, we're inflicting significant damage to some very sensitive tissue that surrounds the tumor. And we know that this, particularly in children, can lead to hormonal growth and cognitive issues. And even still, the five year survival rate for brain cancer has not changed in 30 years. So how can we treat such a difficult disease? My solution is the use of an alternative radiation source, a synchrotron. A synchrotron produces light radiation that is exceptionally powerful and very fast. To put this into perspective, the radiation dose delivered at a synchrotron is over 5,000 times faster than what we can deliver in a hospital. This fast radiation dose is critical to treating difficult cancers, but we can do better than this we can insert a collimator, which is effectively a comb. This forms our beam into peaks of exceptionally high dose and valleys of significantly lower dose. This is microbeam radiation therapy, or MRT. MRT is powerful. The peaks of the beam sever the tumor like a knife, whilst the surrounding healthy tissue is essentially unaffected. But again, we can improve this even further. We can add nanoparticles directly to the tumor. Nanoparticles, which are tiny specks of metal, interact with the MRT to produce extra radiation that is specifically localized to the tumor. This means that we can selectively increase the damage delivered to the tumor and further decrease any extra dose delivered to the surrounding healthy tissue. Nanoparticles combined with our knife-like beam and the speed at which we can deliver the radiation means that we can treat a tumor with just one shot. This is exceptional compared to current hospital treatments, which require daily radiation for many weeks. This April, we treated brats with brain cancer with this exact method. Without treatment, the cancer causes death within 20 days. With our one-shot treatment, we have a quarter of our cohort remaining at 100 days and counting. This is proof 
that we are laying the foundations to finally curing brain cancer. Thank you, Sarah. I'd now like to invite Natalie Chapman to ask a question for Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. I really, really enjoyed your presentation and you're obviously really passionate about it and such a, a great worthy cause that you're working on. And I fear brain cancer myself. So, you know, this is, this is feeling better knowing that there might be a solution uh, sort of down the track. Um, I'm just interested in the future when this becomes, you know, less research and more real, uh, whereabouts are you suggesting the patient would go for treatment? Would there be a dedicated beamline on the end of the synchrotron or would there be hospital facilities nearby? How, how, how do you envisage that might work in terms of applicability? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And when ANT, well, the synchrotron was built, it was built with this exact answer in mind. So the beamline is called the imaging and medical beamline. So there's already a specific beamline at the synchrotron and a hospital-like structure already exists. So when it was built, there are rooms with patients, patient rooms, uh, doctor rooms, there's toilets and everything. Um, obviously, we can't have a synchrotron in every city. Uh, the synchrotron in Melbourne is the only synchrotron in Australia. So there is current work to being actually able to make a synchrotron smaller and do something called mini beam or be able to replicate micro beam radiation with a smaller beam instead of doing a one huge synchrotron. And if we can make them smaller, then that would be great. But at the moment in synchrotrons globally, there is hospital-like structures already in existence and we'd be taking advantage of that. Uh, so yeah. Great, thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, that was Sarah Vogel from EIS. Up next is Natalie Day. Natalie is conducting her doctoral study of early, of early self-regulation development and the play with Early Start. She completed her master's at Cambridge University, specialized in the development of a play for pedagogies. She's a student member of Center of Excellence for the Digital Child. Natalie will present Planting the Seeds to Nurture Children's Self-Regulation. It may not surprise you to learn that the home environment is considered one of the most significant influences on a child's development. And research tells us it's what parents do rather than who they are that matters the most. If parents can learn to provide rich experiences, they can support their child's development. And it's this thinking that forms the basis of my PhD research. Self-regulation is the ability to control behavior toward a goal, despite distractions or impulses that might get in the way. It develops quickly across the preschool period. And the good news is it's influenced by our experiences. Self-regulation at preschool is linked to social competence, and academic attainment. And so the ability of parents to provide rich experiences really does matter. While there's been a surge in self-regulation programs, parent-based programs remain thin on the ground. And this is where the PIP program comes in. Parents in Play is an intervention that capitalizes on the play context and offers coaching to, to parents so that they learn when and how to foster their child's self-regulation. Across eight weeks, I conducted a controlled study to find out if the PIP program modifies parents' guiding behaviors and as a result, children's self-regulation. With self-determination theory as the guiding framework, PIP prioritizes three basic psychological needs that contribute towards a child's intrinsic motivation to regulate their behavior. And those three needs are autonomy, competence, and relatedness. The most noteworthy aspect of the PIT program is that parents were encouraged to let their children experience challenge first and wait for the child's cues for help before stepping in to guide them. The findings tell us that the intervention had a significant effect on parent guiding behavior and that children's self-regulation in the experiment group improved more so than children's self-regulation in the control group. When measured together on a novel task at close intervention, we found that for the experiment group, both parent autonomy support increased and children's self-regulation increased as expected, great news. For the control group, parent guiding behavior did not increase, but 
children's self-regulation did. So what's going on there? What we found is that the parents were preempting the difficulty and they were reducing challenge for their children, making the task easier to complete. Aligned with the literature, children need challenge for self-regulation growth, and so this doesn't support their cognitive growth over time. Remember that what parents do is more important than who parents are, and the PIP intervention offers a sustainable and efficient way to guide parents in learning when and how to support their child's self-regulation towards successful life outcomes. Thank you, Natalie. I'd now like to invite Dr. Erin Twyford to ask a question for Natalie. Thanks very much, Natalie. So the PIP program sounds like a really great solution to help children self-regulate through parent behavior and play. So how do we go from this research to real life applications? Hi, Erin, thank you. Um, yeah, I think the program does show that that parents can definitely change their behaviours and whether that's um, as a bridge between formal learning contexts that um, preschools can offer some guidance for their children, uh, for their parents, for their children in the home, in the home learning environment as a, as a bridge and continuity of, um, of, of care for children or whether it's something that, um, that can be offered in, you know, the discovery space that we have at Early Start invites parents and family members and their play and um, to come and play um, on site and whether that's something that could be offered to the to the families that we get on campus is is a potential as well. That was Natalie, contestant number six from Ash. Next up is Eileen Wallace. Eileen has an abiding interest in human physiology and the application of scientific concepts to solve real world problems. Eileen's degree in biomedical engineering sparked an interest in how advanced fabrication technologies, such as 3D printing, could be used to solve clinical challenges. Eileen will present using 3D printing to treat wounds We've got skin in the game. The skin is our body's first line of defense. It keeps us alive, but in doing so, it takes the hit when we find ourselves in harm's way. Whether it be a burn, ulcer, or a pre-planned surgical procedure, there are over 400,000 Australians today who have a skin wound. And for a lot of them, a Band-Aid isn't gonna cut it. The current procedure for treating these wounds is to take a skin graft from an uninjured site on the patient and use it to patch up the wound. Problem solved, right? Not really. Grafting results in painful donor sites and there's usually a mismatch in skin color and texture. But most importantly, sometimes there isn't enough healthy skin to actually graft. This problem led researchers around the world to ask, if we don't have enough skin to graft, can we just make some more? This has already been done in the lab by growing skin cells on structures we call scaffolds. If the conditions are just right, the cells will start to secrete molecules and minerals, which make up brand new skin tissue. This is what they call tissue engineering. In my PhD, I'm hoping to combine 3D printing with this idea. Basically, a digital model of the scaffold I wanna print is sliced up into layers and then each is printed one by one, stacking on top of each other to eventually form the 3D scaffold. Just like we load ink cartridges into the normal printers we have at home, I also need to load ink into my 3D printer. What's special about the ink I'll be using is that it will have the patient's own skin cells mixed into it, meaning the final scaffold will have cells distributed throughout it. I mentioned before that if the conditions are just right, those cells will start to make new skin tissue. Well, 3D printing gives us really fine control over those important conditions. Things like how hard or soft the scaffold is, how big or small the pores are, even where the cells are located. Currently what I do in the lab is mix human skin cells with inks and print mini 3D scaffolds. I then look at the cells over time to see if they behave how we want them to, tweaking ink ingredients and printer settings until I get the best results. But the real challenge is figuring out how to bring this into the hospital. 
The end goal of my PhD is to have a 3D printing system that a surgeon can use to print directly into a wound. For this, we work closely with end users to make sure every step in the process is feasible. Once the theoretical looks good, we'll then move on to clinical trials, where a surgeon will print these scaffolds into real skin wounds. This will be the ultimate test. It might mean we need to go back and fine tune the inks and printing hardware, but one thing's for sure. This research will bring us a step closer to revolutionising skin wound treatment. We already have the technology. Now it's just a matter of figuring out how to use it to make a difference for those in need. Thank you, Eileen. I'd now like to invite Davina Robertson to ask a question for Eileen. Uh, congratulations, Eileen, on such innovative and interesting research. Um, I noticed not only do you use technology, but you're also using, you know, live skin cells. So my question is, have you faced any challenges in your research? And if you have, how have you overcome those challenges? Thanks, Davina. Great question. Um, so yeah, I am using live skin cells. Um, so what I'm doing at the moment in the lab is culturing those skin cells, cells with these printed scaffolds and I'm um, just seeing whether they're um, viable and proliferating and secreting the right molecules and minerals when they're in a certain ink. And then um, later on down the track, um, it'll be a matter of using already approved clinical technologies which exist that actually take a skin biopsy from a patient and extract their own skin cells and just mixing that into the ink. So the whole project is really set up for a streamlined clinical translation um, so that we face as minimal issues as possible in that area. <laughs> yeah, well said. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was um, Eileen Wallace from AIM. Our next contestant is Catherine Stephen. Catherine is a registered nurse and a PhD student at the School of Nursing. Her doctoral study is an investigation of randomized controlled trial to evaluate a nurse-led intervention to improve blood pressure control. Catherine will present improving blood pressure control in primary care. Hello, I'm Catherine, and I can lower your blood pressure. I know what you're thinking, no, I'm not a Jedi. In fact, I'm not entirely that unique. There are 14,000 others like me in your community that can lower your blood pressure. I'm a nurse. So why do I want to lower your blood pressure? Well, the higher your blood pressure, the higher your risk of kidney disease, stroke, heart disease, and eventual premature death. High blood pressure, measured at 140 over 90, is also known as hypertension, and it can be prevented and treated. You could take medications to lower your blood pressure to a safe level. In addition, your GP might advise you on those lifestyle risk factors known to raise your blood pressure. You could be told to stop smoking, drink less alcohol, eat less, certainly eat less salt, move more. Now, this approach might not work for you, and in fact, you would not be alone. Of those 6 million Australians with hypertension, over 4 million have uncontrolled blood pressure, which means despite taking the medication and listening to the advice, people still struggle to maintain their blood pressure at a safe level. But what if we could improve blood pressure through nurse intervention? That's what my PhD research set out to discover. I conducted a randomised controlled trial across 10 general practices in New South Wales, the IMPRESS study. How did I go about it? Well, often people are unaware that their high blood pressure is an issue as it has no outward signs, symptoms or pain. So we knew we needed to find them first. Nurses at each general practice use clinical auditing tools to identify people at high BP and high risk that were often remained hidden from healthcare. Once identified, they participated in five nurse visits over six months. Each nurse visit provided structured self-management support and specific education on those lifestyle risk factors unique to each individual. Motivational interviewing, goal setting and action planning empowered people to improve their blood pressure 
and make those positive lifestyle changes. At 12 months, we found a statistically significant drop of 11 mmHg systolic. That's the equivalent impact of two medications. Reduce blood pressure, reduce life-limiting chronic disease. No, I'm not a Jedi, I'm a nurse. Nurses can help people to lower blood pressure and lead healthier, longer lives. Thank you, Catherine. I'd now like to invite back Professor David Caro to ask a question for Catherine. Thanks, Catherine, for a fantastic uh presentation on a really important issue the economics of this five visits uh, across six months um, Hong Lin didn't my question come through no no we um i think you we, we lost when you talk about five visits ah sorry Catherine. um fantastic work uh but five visits is a, a big investment in terms of people's time how are you going to scale that up that's a really good question so um, part of the randomized control trial was also collecting uh, outcome data at six and 12 months, but part of it looked at some qualitative data in terms of how uh, feasible and acceptable the intervention was. And in terms of having that investment in time, it's, it's not only thinking about the investment in time in, in, in the case of um, the participant or the patient, but it's also that nursing time and nursing time is valuable. So for ongoing state sustainability, what we would require would be um, investment in terms of a funding mechanism that would support the nurse time. Because um, clearly what we have seen with the impact at 12 months, that that's probably a great return of investment when you can see that the impact that it, it has had. Um, so that would be the next step in this would be to, to continue with our investigation to see how sustainable this model of nurse intervention could be uh, moving forward because the, the outcomes there speak for themselves. So that would be the next step for this project. Great question, though. Thank you. That was Catherine from SMART. Fantastic work. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you, David. Up next is our final candidate, Michael Stapleton. Michael graduated from UOW in 2018 with an environmental engineering degree. And since then, he has grown a passion to protect our pristine environment from being littered with plastics. This passion led him to do a PhD that focuses on issues associated with the plastic recycling industry. Michael will present microplastic pollution from an unlikely source, the unintentional dark side of plastic recycling. Microplastics, little shards of plastics that are less than five millimeters in diameter are slowly becoming one of the greatest ecological issues of our time. They have been found in the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, and even the water that we drink. Plastics are important for everyday living, but microplastics, they are a pesky problem that we are struggling to control. With the amount of plastic waste that we generated, it makes it feel like an impossible task to stop microplastics from entering into the environment. But to better the world for the future, we should strive to do our best and find all sources of microplastic pollution and stop them from entering the environment. Now, my research is focusing on the plastic recycling industry as being a potential source for microplastic pollution. And when we break down the processes involved, we can get a greater understanding of how this is occurring. When the plastic waste enters into the facility, it is reduced in size through the process of shredding, which due to its mechanical nature is expected to generate plastic particles smaller than necessary. After the shredding process, 
The plastic material is then washed to remove any contaminants such as food waste or adhesives. It is in this process where microplastics may unintentionally be left in the wastewater and pollute the environment unless the recycling plant treats the wastewater on site. Now within my study, I'll be imitating the shredding process used by the plastic recycling industry to determine if microplastics are being generated. I'll be focusing on whether there are particular factors that may increase the rate that microplastics are being generated. Factors such as the type of plastic being recycled, the age of the plastic, and even the rotational speed of the shredder will potentially be the point of difference in whether microplastics are being generated or not. My results have already shown that microplastic particles are in fact being generated through the shredding process. The type of plastic material being shredded also significantly affects the amount of microplastics being generated. PET bottles, for example, generated significantly greater amounts of microplastic particles when as compared to HDPE bottles. To conclude, from our preliminary results, it is apparent that the plastic recycling industry may be a significant polluter of microplastic particles into our environment. The research that I am conducting is a sensitive topic as the plastic recycling industry are doing so much good in our war on plastic waste. However, it is important to highlight them as a source of microplastic pollution so we can modify the recycling process and reduce the microplastic pollution that is occurring. In doing so, we can move sustainably into the future and continue to recycle our plastics without causing any unintentional pollution. Thank you, Michael. I'd now like to invite back Professor Lorna Moxham to provide a question for Michael. Thank you, Michael. Um, so many of us want to make a difference and are avid recyclers. Can you give us any advice to the to members of the community about recycling based on the outcomes of your research? Yeah, so recycling is necessary and we should all be doing it. Um, we should be probably doing it more so we can make the circular economy. Uh, based on my research, we should continue to recycle. However, we should be putting processes involved or into the recycling process to limit this microplastic pollution. Simple wastewater treatment processes will reduce the amount of microplastics going out into the environment. And my research, I definitely do not want to scare anyone from participating in plastic recycling. I want everyone to be recycling, um, but we just need to fix the process so we're not contaminating the earth. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. This concludes the finalist presentations. The judges will be moving into a new Zoom meeting for deliberations. Now, for everyone watching, the People's Choice Award is officially open via the Zoom poll. You will have five minutes to vote for the finalist that you believe gave the most convincing and engaging 3MT presentation based on your understanding of the judging criteria. Good luck.
I would like to take this moment on behalf of everyone who helped organize this event to personally thank the judging panel for their contribution. I would also like to thank the nine finalists for the hard work they've done in this event and for their value contributions to the world of graduate research. Congratulations to all of you and thank you for taking part in the 2022 3MT competition. The People's Choice Award has now closed and the judging panel will return shortly. Thank you all for voting. Thank you, Jack. What an incredible afternoon. This afternoon is a celebration of talents we have here at UW. While the judging panel is finalizing their deliberations, you will hear a short piano recital by Associate Professor Andrew Zamet Manjin from his recent performance at Sydney Piano Lovers Competition in which he won the second place. Congratulations, Andrew.
What a treat, what a beautiful performance. And that's Chopin's extraordinary ballad, number one in G minor, played by Associate Professor Andrew Zamet Manjin from the National Institute for Applied Statistic Research Australia at UW. That was really amazing performance. I hope you enjoyed, you enjoyed it. I think the judges have returned and very exciting moment now. We are going to find out the winners of the 2022 UOW 3MT final. Thank you, Honglin. It's now my pleasure to welcome Professor Lorna Moxon to say a few words and to announce the winner of the People's Choice Award. Thanks, Jack. Um, what do you say? Wow, wow, wow. At the University of Wollongong, we have many, many HDR gems, and they're often hidden under a bushel. 
But today we had nine wonderful gems on display. However, we do have, the University of Wollongong has over 1,500 HDR gems and they're all supported by UOW talented and dedicated supervisors. Thank you to everyone today. So what I'm about to announce is the People's Award. This person presented with precision, passion and presence. So it's a pleasure to announce that the people have chosen improving blood pressure control in primary care, Catherine Stephen, as the people's choice. No, no way. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> Catherine. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations, congratulations, Catherine. What amazing uh, presentation. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like now to welcome Professor David Caro to announce this year's runner-up. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Hong Lin. Uh, and again, to echo um, Lorna's words, wow. Uh, the future is in wonderful hands with the uh, uh, the intellect and passion, the commitment we have of higher degree research uh, scholars across the university. Uh, it's my great pleasure to announce the, uh, the runners up, uh, and that is plural. Uh, the uh, judging panel was um, actually torn. Uh, and um, uh, like most judging panels these days, if you're torn, you just say, well, let's add another um, uh, let's add another prize. So it it is with uh, great uh, joy that I get to announce that uh, the the joint runners up are Michael Stapleton and his work on uh, uh, microplastics. Uh, and um, for her second trip to the podium for the day, um, it's great to have uh, Catherine Stephen back uh, once again. Congratulations to you both. Uh, great work, and we really, really look forward to uh, the impact that that is going to make across our communities in the years to come. And now um, it's my great pleasure um, to be able to announce the winner of the 2022 University of Wollongong three minute finals. Um, to not prolong the su suspense, I will announce the winner. The winner is Sarah Vogel for her work on treating brain cancer with one shot. Um, congratulations, um, Sarah. But um, just while I still have um, the floor for just, just a moment, I just really wanted to echo the comments of my colleagues of what a wonderful afternoon it's been. It's been a very inspiring uh, afternoon. Uh, congratulations to all of the finalists and also congratulations to everybody who's participated um, in the 2022 uh, three minute thesis from the heats um, in the faculties to the finals. And my sincere thanks to the Graduate Research School and colleagues for organizing this very important part of um, the University of Wollongong uh, research calendar. Um, so thanks so much, everybody. And a special congratulations, Sarah. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, and thank you so much for your support and your presence at the 3MT means a lot to the finalists and to us. Sarah, I'd like to invite you back. What well, congratulations. What an thank incredible so presentation. Uh, I'm very grateful. Um, I'm really excited to go to the Asia Pacific finals because I'm exceptionally passionate about my research. And it's an area of research that I think drastically needs some more funding. So hopefully I can reach some interesting people with my work and maybe get a little bit of funding for our, to get more of our research off the ground. Um, and yeah, thank, thanks so much for today. Thanks to everyone who presented and congratulations to everyone else. They were all amazing presentations and I learned 
a lot of new things today. And yeah, thank you for the Graduate Research School for putting this on. And my only hope is that maybe next year we can have it in person. Thank you, Sarah. For the people who wanted to enter the 3MT, Sarah, I, I have one more question for you. Um, for the people who wanted to enter 3MT today, uh, ne next year, tell us how did you get everything down into three minutes? That was really hard. Um, but I think it was thinking about, I think when we were talking about a Hongling, you said that you needed to tell a story. So you needed to present, you introduce the problem and the challenge and then explain how you solved it and then provide a resolution, like what that would look like in the future. So it's it's a story from start to end. And I know that my research has, has a really compelling story and I'm sure that everyone's research has a very compelling story. So you just need to tell it. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing your experience. Yes, we have. It's it's such a journey. I had the privilege and the pleasure to watch all our fellow contestants grow from their faculty heats to the final, and what a remarkable improvement they have made. Thank you very much, um, everybody. Jack, hand over back to you. Thank you, Hong Lin. Uh, yeah, congratulations to all our winners and to all our finalists. Um, it's been wonderful learning about all of your research, and I would just now like to invite Professor David Caro to share his thoughts on this year's 3MT event. A three-minute thesis is the ultimate challenge, um, and being able to distill so much work uh, into that three minutes is critical for all of us uh, as researchers and as communicators. Uh, we've seen today great examples of that, and I wish Sarah all the best as she goes to the uh, uh, regional uh, finals uh, hosted by University of Queensland. I'd like to thank the uh, Graduate Research School and all of the team, uh, but particularly to uh, Camilla and Nat for their great work uh, in bringing this together. Uh, it is critical that uh, as uh, universities, we are solving real world problems and we're telling the world that we are working with them and for them in order to solve those problems. To each of you as finalists, congratulations, you're all winners. Um, and uh, I hope that we will continue to see uh, the growth in uh, uh, three minute theses as, uh, as the years go by everyone. Uh, should be putting themselves forward for this. Uh, it's a great discipline and uh, I've really enjoyed um, the presentations that we've had today. Uh, thank you to uh, all of the entrants and uh, I hope you have a great evening. Thank you, David, for that re reflection. And thank you very much for your support for, for Graduate Research School and the Graduate Research Training. Um, I trust you all had had great afternoon watching the creative and enjoyable presentations by our finalists and also the musical piece by our very talented professor, associate professor Andrew and Andrew Manjin. And congratulations to all finalists again. And the events like this involves many hours of preparation leading up to the event. So I would like to thank Dr. Lee Watson from the Learning and Development Unit for running the tra training workshop and providing feedback in the practice run. And I'd like to thank uh, all our uh, associate deans of grad high degree research and the head of postgraduate studies for running the faculty heats and to the strategic marketing and the community. Oh, Hong Lin, you're muted. Thank you, Hong Lin. I'm so sorry how did that happened. Um, okay, so thanks to the Strategic Marketing and the Communication Unit for helping us to promote the 3MT event. And finally, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the training and development uh, team, Catherine Berger and Dr. Natalie Stefanik and Emily Keogh for their hard work and tireless efforts that made this event possible. And thank you, Jack, for co-hosting this event with me. And you bring some professionalism in, 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 in this, in, in this emceeing uh, uh, job. I'd like to thank you all, our audience, for joining this afternoon to support our presenters.
and goodbye now and look forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you.